Welcome to the Idiot Box. My name is Jeremy and I'll be your idiot this evening. Tonight I'm going to be reviewing episode 3 of the Amazon Prime original series, The Peripheral. But before we get into that, please take a moment and do the button thing. It really helps the channel a lot. Episode 3 opens with a flashback of Corbell Pickett dealing with a motorcycle gang in an event that must have taken place roughly 10 to 15 years prior. Since the show is set in 2032, that means these events happened kind of now-ish. In this flashback, Corbell locks the bikers in these bulletproof cars and lets them cook to death in the sun. I don't think we actually have the technology to do what Corbell does here, but maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe this stub was created a lot earlier than we think it has, and the Londoners have had a few decades to mess with the timeline. I really don't think we should be taking anything for granted at this point. We cut to 2032 where Corbell is having a chat with his wife about the $10 million offer to kill the Fishers. Mary Pickett is surprisingly sanguine about the whole affair. Let's go ahead and add her to the character map. I'm honestly not sure how to feel about Mary Pickett at this point, I find it kind of refreshing that she's engaged and participating in Corbell's criminal empire. It makes sense to be that a opportunistic psychopath would be attracted to someone like Corbell. I only hope she gets her fair share of the consequences when things inevitably turn violent later. I feel like my head's about to explode. There's a brief scene in which Flynn tells Billy Ann everything that has happened so far which does not make Burton happy. Like, at all. Flynn discovers that Burton has used some of the Milagros cold iron money to buy the Forever Fab, which he has turned into their base of operations. Flynn exhibits more symptoms of a mystery ailment that is undoubtedly related to the headset or quantum tunneling in some way. Or perhaps it's because of whatever she downloaded into her brain that night of the heist with Alita West, because I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Alita made it clear that Flynn needed to use her right eye. The left eye was the organic eye they took from the woman they kidnapped from the party. The right eye is the one that connected directly back to Flynn in 2032. I'm betting the farm that whatever they stole from the research institute that night is in Flynn's brain in 2032. Flynn returns to London to share what she remembers about the heist and her last moments with Alita West. Please tell me you do not keep me in a box when I'm not here. The Londoners warn her that Corbell has likely been hired to kill the Fisher family, which of course spooks Flynn all the way back to 2032 to tell Burton. We see a brief flashback of young Alita and Wilf being adopted by the Nethertons, followed by Wilf visiting their adoptive mother in the hopes of finding a lead on Alita's whereabouts. As luck would have it, Alita did leave a rather cryptic clue with their mother. Can't quite understand why she needs to play at such riddles. I also don't know why Alita would give such a ridiculously cryptic answer to such an ordinary question. The whole thing feels like a clumsily contrived breadcrumb to me, and I don't care for it. Finding nothing but cryptic hints from their mother, Wilf joins up with Flynn to do a foot search of the area where Flynn met Alita in Episode 1. Wilf links his mind with Flynn's to help them better coordinate their search. This is the kind of wetware network I mentioned before, where two people connect their minds in something like a mesh network. There is a scene where Flynn draws the attention of a Met police officer, and Wilf has to talk his way out of a potentially compromising situation. You know that scene in the spy movies where the boy spy has to pull the girl spy into an impromptu kiss to avoid the scrutiny of the spy hunters? This is exactly that scene, only ten times longer and way more pretentious. Meanwhile, Burton confronts Corbell about the contract on their lives and offers him a deal. I've got a carrot, and I've got a stick. There is a brief exchange in which Burton threatens to put bullets in Corbell's ears, but they compromise on a layaway program instead. 
Burton will pay Corbell $200,000 a week to not kill them. Corbell decides he likes dollars more than bullets, and they shake hands very publicly so that Tommy Constantine can see them and grow increasingly suspicious. This isn't actually a great deal for Corbell. The research institute is offering him $10 million to kill the Fishers. Burton is offering him $200,000 a week to not do that. At that rate, it would take Burton 50 weeks to match the $10 million that the Research Institute would pay out by the end of week one. Not a great carrot. On the other hand, Burton does explain about the haptic implants a little bit here. It turns out that the haptic implants network the members of his squad together in that kind of wetware network that we were talking about in one of my earlier videos. Burton explains that I'm not just me now. I'm all the men I served with. To be clear, the threat here is that even if Corbell succeeded in killing the Fishers, Burton's buddies would fall on him like rain. So even though the money isn't a great incentive, the idea of not being murdered by a bunch of military vets does have some appeal. Back in London, Charisse meets with Daniel atop one of the city's statues. It seems that Charisse is unhappy with the progress that Daniel has made in killing Finn. Which is to say exactly zero progress in that direction. Flynn remains 0% dead. So Charisse threatens to have Daniel killed if he doesn't pick up the pace. As part of her threatening monologue, Charisse demonstrates her ability to... fly. I don't know how else to interpret this scene, and I have to admit it's a bit beyond what I was prepared to accept from a Londoner. I understand that Londoners have access to significantly advanced technology, but what we're seeing here departs from science fiction and takes a jaunty stroll into comic book supervillain territory. If I accept that Charisse can fly on a whim, then I have to accept that she can just do whatever she wants at any time. I wonder if the writers realize how much this undermines the integrity of the character. Because if Charisse is able to just fly like that, then that means there are no rules governing what this character can do. She can do anything she wants at any time. So the only limits on what Charisse is able to do or not do is the convenience of the writer. She's not a character anymore. She's a magic smoke monster that just does whatever the writer needs them to do in any given scene. She's just walking around dispensing deus ex machina. She's boring now. Shortly after this flying scene, Charisse murders the woman who leaked information to Alita West. She does so in a comically villainous scene where she tampers with the woman's tea in order to cause her to be swarmed by bees. I am rapidly losing interest in this character. Why is she behaving this way? She's like a Bond villain. She has no reason to kill these people. She seems to be doing it because she enjoys it. There's a comic book supervillain running amok in a perfectly good science fiction story. At this point, the only way I'm going to be able to continue buying into this character is if it turns out that future London really is just a sim, and the character of Charisse Newland is being played by some sociopath loser on a power trip. Back in Clanton County, where things still make sense, Jasper Baker delivers Burton's first $200,000 payment to his uncle Corbell. Corbell takes advantage of the moment to coerce Jasper into agreeing to snoop on the Fishers and find out what's going on with that family. Meanwhile, Flynn conveniently solves Alita's cryptic riddle and leads Wilf Netherton straight to Alita's hideout. The hideout is abandoned and empty, there are clear signs that someone else has been there before them, but there's no indication that they found what they were after. A grandfather clock leads Flynn to discover a secret door leading into hidden rooms deeper within the hideout. Inside, Flynn discovers a creepy diorama of the Fisher residence 
complete with little action figures of Burton and his friends. Wilf discovers Alita's implant, which seems to be held inside of some kind of Faraday cage. The condition of things suggests that Alita meant to return to the hideout, but was unable to do so for some reason. As Wilf and Flynn try to leave the hideout, Daniel arrives with a robot ninja and attacks them. Flynn is able to get the upper hand and begins to demand answers from Daniel, but Charisse takes control of the robot ninja and kills Daniel before he can say too much. There was some very cool stuff in this episode and some very dumb stuff. I really like the discovery of the hideout and how it seems that Alita West has become obsessed with the Fisher family. The grandfather clock, the diorama, it seems like the Fishers are more significant than we first thought. On the other hand, we had this weirdly absurd villainy from the Charisse character. There's just a lot going on in London that breaks the realism for me. You've got these giant weird statues, you got the flying CEO supervillain, these weird ass robot ninjas running around. It's all a bit much, and I, I really hope that we find out that it's all just a simulation. I'm gonna be disappointed if it turns out that all of those things are really exactly what they appear to be. We're three episodes into the show now, and we really should be getting a good sense of what the series is about. I'm still interested and I'm still going to keep watching it, but I'm starting to get a bad feeling. Everything that's happening in the 2032 timeline is really good. I like it a lot, except for the invisible cars. But when we transition to the London timeline, uh, things start to get a bit iffy. Uh, things in that timeline kind of strain the realism of the show for me. I'm going to keep watching it and I'm going to keep reviewing the episodes. I'm going to do the whole season. But uh, at this point, I'm, I'm kind of starting to get a bad feeling. Anyway, that's all I have for this video. Uh, if you're enjoying my reviews of the peripheral, please take a moment to subscribe. That way you won't miss the next one. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll see myself out now.